everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. It's wonderful to see you, whether you are a present member of the College of Science, whether you are one of our parents, whether you are an alum, whether you are a friend of the college, we are thrilled to have you here with us. And I am particularly thrilled to discuss with you today the question of women in science. I could talk for many hours, honestly, on this topic. I um, have had much experience myself as a woman in science. I have a family history, which um, is really an interesting one regarding the progression of women in science and the opportunities open to women in science, which is a most encouraging story. But I am also deeply aware that despite the fact that women make up a huge sector of our population, the representation <clears throat> of women in science is not proportional to the representation of women in society. And it's an interesting question why that is. I think the answer is a complex one. It's not one that can be addressed with a magic wand, the wave of a wand, I wish it could. It's one that we think about a great deal in the college and that we are addressing in many ways in the college. My commitment is to bring into the college brilliant scientists, trainees who are women, who will make our demographics match those of society because that is who we should be. We should be the representation of society within our college and the insights that come from members across every sector of society is who we should be as a college. It is where our insights will come most deeply and most resonantly with the challenges in science and society that we are trying to address. I am thrilled today that we are going to highlight some of our outstanding college members who are women and um, We'll introduce those in, in just a moment, but I want to say two things before. One is that we are making wonderful progress in representation of women in some of our fields in the college. And I want to specifically highlight our departments of mathematics and physics, which for some reason are very poorly represented with women faculty and students, but the faculty part has really been on our minds. And why is that? And can we address this question? And over the last two years, we have made a number of absolutely brilliant hire, faculty hires who happen to be women in those departments. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see that those departments, which are, are so lacking in female representation, are becoming much more um, fulminant in their, in their faculty um, representation of women. And so I, I wanted to point out that. Um, and we've been doing this through a new faculty hiring scheme that we call INVEST, that we are very proud of across the college and has um, um, demographic representation as one of its goals. The other thing that I want to point out is how proud I am to see three students who are the first recipients of our Advancing Women in Science scholarship here. I want to thank the donors who have made this scholarship possible. My deepest thanks to you. It is so extraordinary to have your partnership in honoring our extraordinary College of Science students. And we have Emily Nassen, Lauren Gloop. Lauren, I have no idea if I'm saying it right. Gloop? Gloop? You got it right, yes. Is this right? That's right. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I should have checked with you. And Annika Padden, and I warmest congratulations to each of you for being the recipients, the first recipients of the scholarship. Those are just two highlights that I want to give you as to what is going on in the college to ensure that the women we are training, the women who are on our faculty are so acknowledged. I want to acknowledge also Professor Hannah Sayer and Professor Sarah Constantino, our two, two of our newest um, 
faculty members in the departments of chemistry and chemical biology and psychology respectively. It is absolutely thrilling and an honor to have you on our faculty and welcome to the college. Hannah, you've been here a while, so I did a little, a little longer than Sarah, um, but absolutely fabulous to have you both here. That is enough from me. I turn you over now to our outstanding Associate Dean for Equity, Randall Hughes. And Randall, please lead us from here on out. Thank you. Great, thank you, Hazel. I'm gonna do the requisite, take a minute to share my screen. Okay. Um, so thanks again, Hazel, for that introduction. I'm just gonna take a minute to um, share a little bit more context about how in the College of Science we're working to promote gender inclusion. Um, and, and then we'll turn it over to the, the students and faculty that I know you're here to hear from today. So as many of you have heard before, our goal in the College of Science is to solve the greatest challenges of our world, combining research with experiential education and innovation. And in pursuit of this goal, equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice are not some separate areas of focus, we aim for them to really be integrated throughout the fabric of the college and of our mission. And so while we think about diversity very broadly, um, recognizing that we each hold multiple intersecting identities and that the positionality of those identities uh, can change depending on those around us, because March is Women's History Month, today I'm really gonna focus on where we are and where we're going with respect to gender equity in the College of Science. So I like data, so I'm gonna show you just a little bit of data. Um, so to give you a little context, here are data for uh, undergraduate students, graduate students, staff, and faculty with current percentages of women in the college shown in the black circles and relative to sort of a basic expectation of 50% in the red dash circles. And so as you can see, uh, we have greater or equal representation of women uh, compared to that expectation for undergraduate students, graduate students, and staff, while women faculty remain underrepresented. Now, representation is really only sort of the first part of the story. We also really need to consider where we are uh, with respect to inclusion and belonging in the college. And there, um, I would argue, we still have some work to do. So despite the high percentage of women undergraduate students in the college, um, we still see evidence for what Hazel likes to call the insidious disrespect of women um, that pervades STEM fields. And so, for example, here are responses to um, a question on our College of Science climate survey that we ran in fall of 2021. So women and men undergraduate students rated their level of agreement with the statement, I am treated with respect as an undergraduate student in my college. Disagreement is shown in the warmer colors and then uh, agreement is shown in blue. And as you can see, women showed greater disagreement and less agreement with this statement, indicating that even though there's greater overall re representation at the undergraduate level, we still need to ensure that women feel a sense of belonging in our college and in the field as a whole. Now, as a side note, we have data for similar questions um, and see similar patterns for both graduate students and faculty. Um, but not for staff. Okay, so what are we doing about it? Hazel mentioned um, several of the initiatives and I'll, I'll reiterate those here. Um, but as she said, you know, we are tackling this from multiple directions. So first we've really prioritized increasing gender diversity and representation at all levels um, from the Dean's office leadership to faculty, staff and students. Um, and we've also focused on making sure that the departmental seminar series and the conferences that we um, sponsor within the College of Science that include external speakers also have uh, representation of, of women and other groups. And finally, we are focusing on this uh, goal of creating a culture of respect and a sense of belonging um, through workshops and trainings available to everyone in the college. Um, so for example, some of you have participated over the last two weeks in a speaker series uh, of workshops that we've had to identify and disrupt academic bullying. If you're interested in learning more, 
Um, recordings of these earlier events are available on the College of Science YouTube channel. And we do have our final event tomorrow from 1030 to 1130. And I would love for you to join us. And of course, um, one of our flagship initiatives to promote gender equity for undergraduates, begun with the generous support of donors, um, is the Advancing Women in Science Scholarship. So this is a $10,000 award for second year women undergraduate students in the College of Science that really is focused on increasing opportunities for experiential learning, whether through co-ops here or abroad, through dialogue of civilization courses, or other experiential opportunities of interest to the awardees. The AWS scholars also participate in a cohort-based professional development and networking program um, that's specifically aimed at this uh, issue of, of sort of belonging and inclusion. And so last year, we awarded our first cohort of Advancing Women in Science scholars to the three excellent students pictured here who are with us today and who you will have the pleasure of hearing from in just a minute. We're currently reviewing applicants for the 2022-2023 scholars who will join Emily, Lauren, and Annika in professional development and networking activities uh, over the next year. And so before I turn it over to Linda Arapatov, our Associate Director for Student Programs in the college, um, I'd just like to highlight a few additional events going on um, for Women's History Month over the next few weeks. Uh, first, the College of Science has partnered with the other STEM colleges at Northeastern uh, to create a series of events that may be of interest, one of which is actually happening concurrently um, with us today, and the last of which is occurring on March 31st. Um, in addition, the College of Science and the Advanced Office of Faculty Development are co-sponsoring uh, science and culture journalist, journalist Jessica Nordell um, for a discussion of her new book, The End of Bias, um, and so I encourage you all to register to attend. And so now I will stop sharing and turn it over to Linda, who will lead us in a discussion with our scholars. Awesome. Thanks, Randall. Um, so I would love to um, hear from our um, scholarship recipients that are here with us. Um, so um, we have Lauren, Emily, and Annika here. Um, I'd love to go around to just hear um, uh, your majors, um, uh, what year you are in the college, um, just to give a little quick intro for everybody. Um, why don't we start with Lauren? Hi, so I'm Lauren and I'm a third year behavioral neuroscience major and I have a minor in global health. Awesome, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a third year math major with a minor in data science. Um, and Annika. Hi everybody, it's great to be here. My name's Annika Padin. I'm a third year applied physics major with minors in math and electrical engineering. Awesome. Uh, so I'd love to hear um, from you all how you are using this award to facilitate your goals of experiential learning in science. Um, anybody can go. <laughs> I can go. Um, so I've been uh, with this award, I've been able to conduct unpaid research with faculty here since last May. Um, I've been working with the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice. Um, and we're conducting a project looking into healthcare um, access and barriers that transgender and non-binary individuals face. Um, and hopefully I'm also going to use this award to pay for registration fees and things like that to present that research um, at the American Public Health Association conference in the fall next year. Awesome. I think I'm gonna, first of all, Lauren, I wanted to say that sounds like an amazing position and that's such important work. So congrats on that. Um, currently, I am living in Milan, Italy for a global co-op. I'm working at the University of Milan doing research on nanoparticles and quantum materials. Um, and this would have been an unpaid position otherwise. So I'm using the scholarship towards my housing and just as compensation. I am planning on using the scholarship to go on the math department's dialogue to Hungary this summer. Um, originally, I also was interested in using it for a co-op position this spring. Um, so I was able to look into unpaid positions or lower paying positions that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to consider. Um, it just worked out that the position I'm in now is paid. So it opened up the opportunity to, to look into the dialogues. 
Awesome. Um, these sound like really amazing experiences that you're either having, have had, or are going to have soon. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about um, how you think this award and these experiences will further your career and advance your career in the sciences? I can go again. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go. Sorry. <laughs> um, I know just like Emily was saying, it definitely opened up a lot of opportunities for me to like even begin considering things that I wouldn't have been able to think about. Um, I'm going to do a co-op in the spring. That's another stipend co-op, so it's lower paying, but it's um, research in an academic lab that I just wouldn't be able to take otherwise. Um, so basically just giving me the opportunities for things that really make me happy and work that I want to do. Um, and also just getting to meet other women who have progressed in their careers in science, getting to see what they're interested in and how they've made it there. I, um, man, I just lost my train of thought. So by getting to do this research full time, I think I'm able to make a more significant contribution than I would have otherwise if I took on research part time, which I did during the fall uh, while I was in classes. And I really felt like I was just like sacrificing time just to make for the research. So I'm really enjoying doing it full time right now. Um, and uh, because of that, and because of making such a great contribution, being able to put in a lot of hours, there's an opportunity for me to get published as a result of the research I'm doing. And that is something fingers crossed that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Like Lauren mentioned, um, this has introduced me to other women in science and just made me feel like I'm part of another community. Um, it's also given me more confidence in my own place as a woman in science, um, just knowing that I deserve to be here and other people see it too. Um, and again, like I said before, it gave me the financial freedom to look into opportunities that I'd written off because they weren't feasible before. So great to hear from all of you that you know, this has really given you the opportunity to seek those things out, like you were saying, that you might not have otherwise been able to do because of the financial limitations and stipends and having to juggle multiple things at once. So that's really awesome to hear. I'm so glad that you've been able to take this um, and really do some amazing things with it. Um, I'd like to also open this up now to our faculty, um, Dr. Sarah Constantino and Dr. Hannah Sayre. Um, and I'd love to hear from you both a little bit about um, your identity as a woman in science and how um, you know, that has influenced maybe the type of work that you've done and have been interested in as well. Um, whoever would like to volunteer. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, we're, I, at least for myself, I'm interested in science and I don't know that that has necessarily been affected by my gender. Um, I think that um, my, maybe my expectations for myself and other expectations, pe other people's expectations have been affected, but not the actual science that I do. I can, I'll just build on that by saying, I was thinking about this a little bit in advance of this conversation today. And while I feel similarly, I don't think it's affected the science I do. I was thinking a bit about my career trajectory. And I think that in some ways has been affected, not, not so directly, but when I think back to different decisions I made, different fields I left and decisions I at times that I made to leave academia or come back, I think those weren't but explicitly because of my identity as a woman, but I think they weren't helped by that and that there would have been certain things that could have happened differently along the way that would have resulted in a different trajectory. So I, I can, I'll say a little bit about myself if there's time for that. Um, I started in economics, which is a very male dominated field, but not just, it's also a field that has a certain, um, conferences, presentations can be pretty aggressive and the kind of dynamic is a pretty aggressive one. And while I did well, I did end up leaving and um, I never had a strong female mentor in economics. And I think part of it was a confidence issue. Um, like I was, I just wasn't putting myself up 
or out for the same opportunities as I might have had I had a strong female mentor or had I had uh, had I been more confident with respect to the other people, you know, in, in my cohort, in my master's or in undergrad. And so that, you know, I left academia for a bit and then I came back and actually went into a different field. I studied cognitive science, which is much more gender balanced, at least at the early career level and student level. Um, and uh, so I, I was thinking a bit about that decision. And I think that's one way in which my identity as a woman has shaped the research I ended up doing. I don't think my day-to-day -day research though is, is particularly shaped by that identity. Yeah, no, that's a great perspective as well. Um, I think that so many people who have any kind of like marginalized identity in society, right? We can um, have so many things telling us that, you know, we're not supposed to be doing something or if you don't see yourself represented, then it definitely changes um, the way that you're seeing yourself in those spaces and the changes that you might make in these decisions. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you touched on that. I think that's something I was trying to allude to kind of that is like what, um, you know, knowing that we're so marginalized in these spaces, how do we kind of build off of that? Um, but sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, I would love to hear from both Sarah and um, Hannah about, um, you know, their roles at Northeastern and the research that they are um, a part of right now. Um, Sarah, thank you for sharing a little bit about that. Um, Hannah, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, so I do research that is a different approach to solar energy than what people typically think about. I create molecules that absorb light and then use that light to initiate a chemical reaction. And the goal of this research in the long term is to be able to use energy from the sun to drive chemical manufacturing for all of these chemical goods that we have. You know, think about chemistry is everywhere in the dyes of your clothing to um, the glue that holds your, the soles of your shoes together. Um, I would not have thought that I would be here at Northeastern setting up a research group um, 15 years ago. I'm a first generation student and um, I had my first child in uh, my last year of undergrad um, and didn't know that you get paid to go to graduate school and that your tuition is waived and you get a stipend. Um, and so I took uh, several years off, several, three years off um, to work in industry um, before my partner encouraged me to, to go back to graduate school. Um, and I had fabulous mentors um, throughout my graduate program um, and beyond. Um, so that, that's why I'm here. Um, and I think it's important to pass that on um, as well. Yeah, awesome. Um, you both talked about mentorship. Um, and the importance of that um, and make, you know, giving you these opportunities to get to where you are. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about these specific mentorship roles um, that people have played in your life and your experiences um, in your career because of that? Yeah, I think every mentor is a little bit different, just like, you know, every person is a little bit different. And each person who can serve as a mentor for you will contribute something completely different. So everyone's advice um, is, is unique. Um, my first mentor in graduate school was really supportive of my confidence and um, my ability to, to be in graduate school and to just overcome the obstacles. Um, and then I, my second graduate school mentor, um, both of whom were women, um, was, is just so tenacious um, and really taught me the power, of how you have to stick up for yourself as a woman in science. Um, and uh, then I, I had a postdoc mentor who is male, and, but just uh, a great advocate um, for women in science. Um, I think that's something that a lot of men can do is advocate for 
early career women in their field in science. Um, and I think a lot of a, a lot of men in science, I think, feel this kind of insecurity of being on in the the narrow space that exists between ignoring the problem and mansplaining. Um, but there is a space there to to be an advocate, um, and I definitely benefited from that as a postdoc. Awesome, and you touched a little bit about. Um... Uh, just not even being aware of certain opportunities, right? That were um, something that you could pursue eventually. And I think that um, there's a sexist stereotype of women that are chatty and you know gossipy and whatever, but what it actually is is connecting with other people and lifting each other up and bringing awareness to things. You know, some people saying, oh, well, I was able to do this and therefore, you know, now you know of this opportunity and you can move forward for it. And I think that's really wonderful. Um, that, you know, we, anyone in a marginalized identity can really share with each other and lift each other up is really amazing. Um, Sarah, can you talk to me a little bit about your um, mentorship experiences as well? Yes. Um, so, so maybe I'll just say I was in economics, I moved out of economics, and now I actually work on uh, sustainability. I work on psychological and sociocultural, uh, political dimensions of sustainability. Um, and I'm joint appointed in psychology and policy. And so I had a kind of meandering path here as I, to get here, um, as I mentioned, um, through different disciplines then also in and out of academia. And I think mentorship has been really important. And I would say it's definitely idiosyncratic and depends, you know, each person has their own different mentorship style. And that's not something I was aware of when I went into my PhD or that I deliberate, deliberately sought out. Um, I think that's something I would now, you know, with the um, benefit of hindsight would pick supervisors or mentors um, with different criteria in mind. And, um, but I had mentors who were very good in, in some ways. I had mostly, um, male supervisors and mentors um, until I got to my postdoc and they were really great in terms of the academic content and I think much less aware of the particular challenges of being a woman in what I went into cognitive science but I worked on computational decision making which was again very a very male um, sphere and I think they just weren't really aware of the challenges. And I think um, I think uh, Hannah might have mentioned that her mentors helped build confidence. And I again, I think that was something that I didn't really have and that was very hard to build in these contexts and that I didn't have mentors that really sort of helped develop that confidence and that sort of limited the opportunities I end up, ended up seeking. Um, but then in my postdoc, I had a very strong female mentor and with a very different mentorship style. Um, and I think that that's when I started reflecting more, uh, thinking more about the deliberate choice of what kind of mentor to seek out and what kind of mentor to be to students as well. Um, and in particular, um, something you were saying about this, uh, there's a different, Linda, I think you were mentioning, you said something about like chatting and gossip and, and things like this, but something that I noticed with my postdoc mentor is that um, she was very willing to say things that might have, you know, show that she didn't know something or say, ask a question and then, you know, or make a statement that ended up being a mistake and being very open about this. And I think that actually really helped me feel more confident in stating things. Um, stating my own observations and knowing that they don't always at first pass have to be um, correct. And that, you know, this is something, it's a learning process. And so that's something that I have tried to do in my own mentorship to create kind of lower pressure environments where people can feel comfortable presenting and have more opportunities to discuss and to disagree where it's not, you know, in front of a really consequential audience or, or something like that. So um, that was important for me. Yeah, no, it's great to hear how you advocated for yourself in those moments and um, are creating that environment for other people to be able to, to voice these questions. Um, that's awesome. Can um, both of you talk to me a little bit about um, some advice that you might have to women who are considering STEM, who might have 
been feeling the same kinds of ways that you were in the beginning? I, so I think I, I said this a little bit, but I think being more knowing that there are different mentorship styles out there and you might, you know, you'll read people's papers and based on that, you want to work with someone or you, uh, you know, you're intellectually aligned, but I think also realizing that it's really important to know how the person is as a mentor. And so speaking to other students of theirs, um, I think is something that would have been helpful for me that I didn't do. Um, and and also maybe to seek out multiple mentors. Like I ended up in situations where I was really attached to one person. And so if there were issues, it was very difficult to communicate those or to resolve those or to bring a third party in. And so just to make sure that there are multiple people that are giving you advice and who have different ways of seeing the world and approaching research, I think that's really important. And that's something I encourage students to do, to speak to other people in the department, speak to people in different departments. Like there, other people might have very different thoughts from my own. And I think that's really important. Awesome. Thank you. Hannah? Um, I think, well, you should have faith in yourself that you can do this. Um, science is a lot more social than I think people show on TV or in movies. It's, uh, we are social people. We talk with other scientists about science. Um, and I think being able to have, the, have conversations about science is important. Um, I would say focus, I mean, in addition to mentorship, I agree that finding the number one thing for the progression of a scientific career from your bachelor's degree is finding good mentors that you have a good working relationship with. Um, and beyond that, um, focusing on the science and making sure that you're doing high quality science, then no one can say that you're not as good as anyone else. Awesome. Uh, I want to turn it over to the um, student recipients as well and ask um, what advice that you might give to a first year student coming in who's just starting their career in science um, and feeling uncertain of their place in this field um, as a marginalized person. Um, what, what advice might you give about, um, you know, what based on what you've experienced so far? I think coming into math, there are a lot of male dominated classes and I was overthinking a lot of how I had to act or present myself. Um, so I was avoiding um, doing, bringing up conversations that were too feminine or dressing too feminine. Um, and it was very unnecessary. You don't need to overthink it. You don't have to fit a certain mold for what you think a woman in science should be. Um, if someone has an issue with it, that's obviously their own issue. Um, so don't overthink it. Focus on your classes, your work that you're doing. Yeah, I think it's really important for um, any marginalized identity in the sciences to like hold on to themselves and what they know about themselves, kind of carrying the same confidence they would have. Like, like Emily was saying, you kind of get in your head. Like I had a quantum mechanics class last semester. It was like 30 people and 27 of them were male students. And it was fine because I had a friend in the class and we were good. <laughs> but um, that actually brings me back to another thing I think Hannah was saying earlier about the expectations that we place on ourselves as women in science. And even from other people, I think they expect more of us because we're women and we're trying to take over the field and push to make everything better. But in the idealized situation, we shouldn't need to constantly be working. And if you're not an advocate and you're just trying to get your little degree, I completely respect that as well. So I think what I would say <laughs> to the incoming women in STEM is to be true to yourself and recognize that 
any adversities you may face in your path are not a result of who you are. It's a result of a system that has failed us to some extent, unfortunately. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think the the pressure to be the best of, um, you know, represent your identity, represent women, represent women of color, like that can be a pressure that can really take over um, and might even get in the way of you doing what you actually set out to do. So um, that's great advice. Thanks, um, Emily, as well. Um, Lauren? Uh, yeah, I know something, I, something that a lot of people have touched on here today. Um, it's just the idea of building your own community, especially early on in your science career. Um, so many, I know for my major at least, like there are so many student organizations that like are focused on pairing first years with older students. Um, I did it when I was a first year, it was so, so helpful. I do it now, like on the other side, trying to help first year students. Um, and just like, it sounds like simple, but like trying to make friends in your classes, people who are going to be with you for the next four years, like as things get harder, you like need people who you want to work together with and you want people to bounce ideas off of and take these experiences with. So just building your own community. Awesome, thank you all. Um, so we can uh, go to um, Hazel now to answer some questions. If anybody wants to put questions in the chat for any of our panelists, um, Hazel will um, moderate that, Hazel. I'm here. Thank you all so much for this really extraordinary discussion. You know, in an ideal world, as we move forward, we will not have this discussion, right? We will be scientists, we will be smart, interested, groundbreaking researchers, educators, who are people, and that is what we strive for. So in a way, we would prefer not to be having this conversation. And it's extraordinary how over the decades, the conversation has both become so much easier and also remained so challenging. And we have to deal with that. You know, my grandmother got a degree in chemistry, extraordinarily. She was the only woman in her class. She got a degree in chemistry and immediately after her undergraduate, she married my grandfather and said to us, the only chemistry she ever did subsequently was in the kitchen. Since then, you know, <laughs> if you compare, I got a degree in chemistry, there was nothing close to me after I got my degree. And so, you know, I can compare my own family history to now and see, yes, we, we're in such a much better place. But listening to each of you, there is this kind of understanding that it remains challenging to be a woman and to be in science. And, you know, it makes me worried, angry, um, but most of all, it makes me committed to really make sure that we move forward and to promote the trajectories of women in science. And I, I think um, I'm, I'm um, really want to welcome anyone who would like um, to put questions in the chat. I just I want to make one comment in reflection of a couple of things that some of you have said. In our College of Science at Northeastern, we're really doing some inventing. And we are inventing a community, a connected community of science. You talked about science being social. It so totally is. We know that science is so collaborative. I look at our new faculty, it is so collaborative. It's a connected community that is both a scientific connected community, but also a community where we work together, where we work socially, where we really all are um, a group. And I think we have in our college an absolutely wonderful opportunity, and we're taking it forward to make this connected community. And you know, everyone here is part of it. And I, I um, wonderful supporters are part of it as well. And I want to acknowledge again, before I go to a question in the chat, everyone who has made the Women in Science Fund possible over the years. This is the fund has been in place. There's been wonderful programming in place. This is the first year of these specific awards, but I want to thank all of the supporters of this fund for allowing us to 
do student programming and to make these awards um, this year. So let me go to the, some questions in the chat. And, and please, if you would like also put your question in the chat, you may also raise your hand. That is fine with us. Um, the, a question in the chat is uh, for both the students and the faculty, what are some of the things that the various fields in science and in education can do to further eliminate barriers for women? And so it's an interesting sort of, we can go even through everyone if you would like to pick out one thing that you think would be a particularly groundbreaking way to move the landscape of women in science forward. I'm going to look at our faculty members first. Hannah, do you want to <laughs> tackle that one? Um, I think for me, something um, that I found really challenging as a first year faculty member and um, my first time teaching a lecture class was um, the mixed reviews from students. Like I tried to teach so hard. I put so much effort into it. And still there's, there are going to be people who are unhappy um, and people who have seemingly gendered comments, like that I'm not friendly and approachable even though I have a line outside my office for office hours. Um, and I don't know the best way to address this. I know that there is a lot of evidence of um, systemic biases that come in teaching evaluations. Um, if, you know, I, there's some, some evidence that um, in hiring, if people do an implicit bias training before making hiring decisions, that helps to eliminate um, their, the implicit bias in hiring processes. I don't know if we could do something like this um, with students before they fill out teaching evaluations. Um, but I did, I did find that really challenging. Hannah, thank you. You know, Randall, I wonder if you want to comment on this. I hear you, Hannah. I know, and, and we know, and I will say we know. So I, I totally. Um, Randall, do you want to comment on that? I really, um, I appreciate the idea because there is, there's overwhelming evidence of bias in, in teaching evaluations. Um, and I think it's not within our purview within the college to, to just get rid of them, but I like the idea of trying to find solutions that, you know, eliminate that bias to the degree possible. Um, so I, I really uh, appreciate that suggestion of the implicit bias test and we'll sort of think about if that's a, something we could at least trial and, and see what happens. Thank you, Randall. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing that. Um, Sarah, would you like to share any thoughts on something we could do? Uh, sure. I think um, Hannah's, as I agree with that one, was thinking along similar lines. But uh, I guess a couple other things, and I'm, I'm very new, um, you know, so uh, these might be in, in place in some way that I haven't discovered yet. But I think having um, a uh, mentor outside, uh, maybe even outside of the department who specifically, you know, it's a female mentor or someone whose goal as a mentor is to help navigate these kinds of potential issues, both in evaluations, but also um, other, other situations in, with, in which biases might arise um, in, in asking, you know, negotiating salaries or, or different context in which um, women typically don't do uh, or don't demand, make as strong a demand or as strong a case. Um, I think that would be really helpful. And then another thing that I personally have confronted is, um, I, or that would have been helpful is I think a little bit more support in moving to a new place and um, in terms of childcare, understanding uh, what's available, assistance in terms of figuring out childcare logistics in a new place, um, whether it's subsidized care, which I know Northeastern actually, there is a daycare that is much more affordable, but how you can ensure that you get a spot or the different options available, I think um, that would have been helpful as well. Um, thank you. 
can you come and talk to me if there if you need to please <laughs> <laughs> and we will do everything we can to help you i would say with regard to mentoring thank you for raising that sarah i want to acknowledge randall um, as Associate Dean for Equity, our Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs, Oyinda Oyalaran, and our Associate Dean for Research, Erin Cram, who have recently put together a really outstanding report on mentoring and a series of recommendations for the college. And you'll be hearing more about this because, um, you know, mentoring is thrown out there as being helpful. But actually, it really is. It's not just a, a catch-all there. It's actually really helpful to have people to bounce things off. You never have to take advice. Advice is a gift, I always say. And if you want to throw it away, that's fine. But if you don't receive the gift, then you don't have the options of what to do with that gift of, of advising. So um, we, we hear you and we have heard in the past and um, Again, Randall can, you know, we will connect with you on that, but we are very much um, on board with powerful mentorship for our faculty and in, in the ways that you um, suggested as well. Outstanding. Thank you. Let's keep going and get some pings from our students about things that they would like. Annika, I'm looking at you. Yes, I had a specific story in so at my first co-op, I was working at a relatively fancy company. It was an industry job. Um, and they had plenty of coffee and free snacks. And I got a free t-shirt and a backpack and everything when I walked in. But I remember the tampons in the women's bathroom. You still had to put a quarter in the machine. <laughs> and just in general, menstrual care should be more equitable to women in any field. And that is something I would like to see changed. That, totally. I think that's a, a really great point. Um, totally. Absolutely. Emily. I think in general, just having events like these and raising awareness, um, not just um, having these events with women, but having these events with men. A lot of people, they think that there's no longer any issues because their coworkers are women. Um, but I think just reminding them that there is still a divide, there is still an issue, there are still struggles, they just aren't as obvious, is always good. Um, and it makes them think about their actions and how they're coming across. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think discussion of, you know, how women are doing in the face of the various societal inputs that are still um, quite, I would say, unsupportive in terms of how women are perceived and how women can proceed. So thank you for those thoughts, Emily. Lauren, please. Uh, I know it's something that's been echoed a few times today, but um, just continuing to get more equitable hiring practices across the board, especially for professors. I know as a student, like one of the most exciting things I can see when I go to take a class is that I can get taught by a woman. Um, and I'm lucky in the College of Science that it does happen more frequently for me where that's an opportunity. There's other um, disciplines where that's not possible all the time. Um, but just knowing that that's an option for you really like makes you more excited to learn in that regard, at least for me. Totally, thank you so much. Um, there's a question in the chat about performance reviews. And Randall, I wonder if you um, would uh, ask this one about including diversity and equity and inclusion goals in performance reviews. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, there is now in sort of the tenure and promotion process, a consideration of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, faculty are asked to address that specifically in their materials. Um, I think it varies at this point by department in terms of whether departmental annual merit review um, also considers that. Um, in my experience, it's most often sort of uh, included in the service category. Um, but I love the idea, especially now that we ask um, faculty applicants to write a, a, an equity statement about sort of how they would handle various situations. Um, I would love to carry that through to um, you know, our current faculty and how they're um, addressing these issues in their classrooms or in their research or in their service. Um, so thank you for that. 
Thank you, Randall. There's a question um, from Savannah Swinea about reconciling feelings of burden and responsibility surrounding promoting gender equity and inclusion. I want to um, actually give a little answer here and then invite any of our panelists to answer it. I um, feel very strongly that you do not have to work for your demographic group and to promote your demographic group. I say that, I hope I said that to you, Hannah, and you, Sarah, when you interviewed here, <laughs> because truly the notion of some kind of tax, that is, it's sometimes called a minority tax, but it, it's, it's really a demographic group tax that is added to being part of a particular demographic group is totally unfair and not required. And so really there should not be a burden in promoting women, if you are in women in science, if you are a woman in science, if you choose to, that's fine, that's great. But, it, but it, there, there is no expectation across the College of Science that you would do that. And it would not hurt anyone to not be doing anything to promote women in science. There is literally no expectation that we have so I wanted to make that statement very clearly because, um, you know, Savannah's question is an important one. There is a sort of undercurrent of expectation and making a statement about your diversity, equity and inclusion landscape is different than actually being required to work for your demographic group. And so I, I think that's an important point that we feel here in the College of Science. Let me see if Randall, if any other one else would like to address that point. Yeah, I'll just add that um, one of the initiatives that the faculty representatives on our college equity, diversity and inclusion and justice committee are working on this year is um, first a qualitative survey of faculty just to gain a sense of how people um, view service. Um, so this could be could play out. So you know, your, your question and suggestion could play out in terms of women faculty performing more service in a number of areas than, than men. Um, and so it is something that we're thinking about and trying to, to get information on to see, is, it, is that happening in, in the College of Science? And then we'll pursue that um, based on the information we get from that first survey. Um, I guess I can respond as a bit of advice for um, growing female scientists, um, you, whether or not this is an expectation, you will be asked, um, certainly as a woman in science to do some service that represent or do something to represent your group. And, um, I think it's important to think about ahead of time, what your level what level you can contribute? How much time are you willing to give um, to, to promoting this? It may be zero and that's okay, um, but have some internal, this is how much I'm going to contribute and then stick to it. Because just by being a woman in science, you're making a difference. Thank you, Hannah, absolutely. All right. Well, I would like to, at this point, thank everyone for their outstanding participation. Um, Linda, thank you for doing such an outstanding job in moderating our panel. Thank you to our students for participating. And um, I see Professor Arimoto has put into the um, chat um, a note. We are, we're so proud to have you on our faculty, um, Toyoko and um, in physics, it's wonderful. The, um, so thank you, thank you, thank you to our students, to Emily, Lauren, and Annika uh, for sharing their thoughts. Congratulations where you are in your trajectory. Congratulations on receiving the scholarship. Absolutely wonderful. And we look forward to hearing of your progress and hearing of where you're going to go next. Um, thank you so much to um, Hannah, Professor Sayer, and um, Sarah, Professor Constantino for being on our panel and for sharing your great 
great insights in such a forthright and useful fashion is much appreciated. Thank you to um, Randall Hughes, our brilliant Associate Dean for Equity, who is leading our college in equity, diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, and thank you, let me see who else, everyone. Thank you to Kevin Thompson, our Associate Dean for Development for all of your work and to Diana for being our um, MC. We appreciate that, Diana. Thank you again to all of you for joining us. Please connect with us in the College of Science whenever you like. We are so available to everyone. And I, with that, um, Diana, I am going to say thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.